everybody. Um, once again, I talk about C17. Um, before in the talk, I talked about the C17 language features. Now we talk about the library features. Um, as usual, uh, it's a little bit difficult to separate between these two because sometimes the library has support for the core features. So, um, but again, um, let's see what I present. So to some extent, I just make sure that if I have two hours, that one fits the first hour and the other fits the second hour. So we are moving more and more towards library or pure library features. Um, yeah, my name is Nikolai Yosote, still author of some C++ books, 20 years involved in C++ standardization, and so it's partially my fault, what we see here. Um, the first thing I want to introduce as uh, library features are so-called vocabulary types, which is, to some extent, we are extending the type system of C++ 17, maybe again. Because in, in the old standard, we had something like, like string and um, pair and tuple, which to some extent are now, well, you can consider them as part of the type system, although implemented as a library, but they are so deeply involved into the system, yeah, so that you can consider that. So, and the first thing I want to introduce here is string view. String view is a new string class or string like class. The idea is that copying a string is expensive because part of a string is the allocated memory to hold the data, so the characters. So that means a string object is uh, just the object itself. And a, ref and a pointer to allocated memory, usually allocated on the heap, unless we have special allocators involved. And that makes copying a string very expensive. So if I copy this string, I have to copy the allocated memory. There is optimization since C++11 to say when I don't need the original, I can steal the allocated memory, but it's still expensive. And the idea of a string view is that we don't care for the management of the strings, of the characters. We have an object that represents an existing sequence of characters which hopefully has, has at least the same lifetime as this object. So as you see on the right, typical application, which is already there in, in many applications, is to say, for example, we memory map data from a file in our program, which means more or less we get direct access to the data on the, on the file system. And instead of allocating memory for it, we just have a reference to the address of this storage, and we handle this and, uh, and send it around so that we save a lot of copies. That means that a string view is faster, but it also has a couple of constraints. And all these constraints make it more complicated to use it. You have to be more aware that you do the right thing if you use it. So one guarantee or one thing is it's not guaranteed that it ends with backslash zero. Yes, you can let it refer to something that ends with a null terminator. But if not, you must be aware that, for example, here on the right, if you say I have a string via to the string data, which is part of a longer uh, character sequence, that after the last A, there is no backslash zero. So if you use it or pass it to C, something surprising will happen. Another interesting thing is that the default constructor for string view um, initializes a string view as a I am not a string, as a null pointer. So that means uh, that's the difference to string. String, if I use a default constructor, is initialized by the, an empty string. This is not the case for string view. 
So you can see it if you ask, give me the data it refers to, and the data will return null pointer. So don't use data without checking the size, because the size will tell you zero. And then you can use that. But that's, that's coming from both things, because no guarantees there. First use size, and then use the data. Never use data without using the size. And there's no allocator support. Sure, we don't have to allocate anything, though that's easy. We have some support for that. It came in very late in the standardization process. So we, I think we don't have enough time to integrate Spring U everywhere in the library. So everywhere else in the library. But we have some support. For example, we have um, a, um, a literal operator for it. So if you have some string literal and it ends with SV, you convert it to a string view. So you can initialize an auto S with this. We have uh, the ability to use quoted. Quoted for strings means that it writes out the string with quotes and escapes uh, backslash, etc. So that's also possible for a string view. And we also guarantee that the hash values of string and string view match. Um, that makes sure that if we, if we hash in, in some containers, that, that the string and string view objects are placed at the same location or are, are equal. That's also pretty expensive. But we, for example, have no integration, for example, for the regex library. The regex library does not understand uh, string view arguments. Now, that raises the question, can we use one as the other? And the decision is that we allow to use a string as a string view because that's cheap. I simply say, more or less say, well, I refer to the data that's anywhere stored in a string, but I don't, you can use a string view as a string without explicitly saying it. So there is a con conversion, but it's explicit. So I have to explicitly convert a string view to a string, and the reason is it is expensive because it allocates memory. And here you see some example what it, for example, means if you initialize uh, functions with string literals. Um, if I have string literals and I want to pass it to a foo object taking a string, in the past we have to compute the length, allocate the memory, and copy all the characters. And that's now better with string view because we only have to compute the length because we keep the length, but um, that's all. We don't have to allocate memory and copy all the characters. But um, yeah, but of course you have to be aware of lifetime issues here. Pardon? Say it again. Do you know if it's a literal, if the length is actually computed, or is it just pulled? No, the question is: Is it is the is the is the length really computed, or is it uh, is there some special constructors? There are special constructors. If I say this is a C string with this size, I can deduce it directly. But if not, it has to be fine. So it depends on which constructor you you use. If you use a constructor just using this string literal, um, I'm according to the standard. This is computed, so we have to find the backslash zero. But I assume that under the as-if rule, this can be optimized by all the compilers. I'm, I'm not aware that we have an, a special constructor for string literals here. Yes, you would just, you would just have a constructor that was templated for way of somewhere. So you say if I have, no, no, you say I, I need a template constructor. No, that's not true. I, I could have an array of characters, not being a string literal, and it has the same type. Too bad, Sean, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we still have all the problems we got from C. <laughs> okay. Um, the question that came up again and again, when should I use string and when should I use C? Cheaper, but maybe more dangerous string view. And one thing we say is, well, if you have an API 
that uses the value of a string, then it's at least something to consider to use a string view. And that means, look here, I have here, for example, a function you getting a prefix, a prefix, a string, which, of course, usually we would declare this to be const reference string. And then uh, here, for example, use some time point computing to, with a, to, to return a string representing the current time with this prefix. That's what this function does. So it, for example, computes the current time, converts it to a string, then the string contains a new line at the end that's um, trailed here, and then return prefix plus the um, computed time string. So if I want to com convert this to string view, um, yeah, by the way, this is not exception safe, but uh, thread safe, so. Um, but um, if I want to now benefit from string view, I can do that. I can perfectly say I want to have a string view argument, and the recommendation is to use it by value because it's cheap. It's only two, two elements, so uh, a length and a pointer. And uh, then I can also use the string view to initialize what C time gives me. Um, again, it's cheap, I can hold it, and uh, then uh, by the way, there are some special functions. For example, here we don't have resize, I, we have, but we have something like remove suffix to say I want to shorten this a little bit. And, uh, but then when I return it, of course, I have to use a string because a string view would refer to some data local in the function, and that would be a huge problem. So... I would use something like that. By the way, we currently have no operator plus yet. We are still discussing whether we want to have that for string view so that it implicitly string view plus string view returns a string. That's something we currently discuss, whether this is a good or a bad thing. A lot of arguments in both directions. Okay, so here, yes, I think uh, we are not aware of all the consequences about introducing string view. We will find out over the next, next years. Be careful with using it. Yeah? So I've always thought of string view as const string reference, but um, so because it's the same string without any modification step. And it's important for people to understand it that you can't change the underlying data, which is why it's string view. You say a string view is like a const string reference, so you can't change yeah, the underlying data? members of string, length and size, but the only thing is it's not null permanent. I can't modify the elements of a string view, are you sure? We, I'm not sure about that. But, so for the moment, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Let's double check that. We, we had in discussion also string span. Well, yes, which is which, like an array but, Things, yeah, let, let me double check that. You might be right, yeah. I should know. But as I say, this is one of the first times I present this library, and I also learn what I don't know yet. <laughs> Good. We have new other basic data structures, um, and these are optional, variant, and any. If you um, come from Boost, you might have heard them all, um, but beware. Um, optional in any is like in boost, variant is not, or at least is significant different. It has the same ideas, but it, uh, it will, there will be differences. So let's, let's talk about them. Optional means we optionally hold a value, so having, uh, we, do you can say we transfer value semantics to reference semantics so that we can also say there's nothing. And uh, variant is you have we have a, a multiple predefined types, and our value can hold at one moment one of these predefined type. Um, and any is that you don't define in ahead which pipes are possible. You can help hold, uh, hold anything in these objects. And now let's look into details. So this is STD optional. As I said, pretty close to boost optional. You can say, I have an optional string. If I don't initialize it with something, that means the string is empty. And, and excuse me, the optional is empty. That means it does not have a string, even not 
an, ultimate, uh, an empty string. And if I initialize it with a string, uh, it gets that value. I can change it by assignments according to some rules. If I want to find out, does it contain a value or not, I can ask has value or, excuse me, you see the conversion to bool. Um, if I want to use the value, I call the member function value. And if there is no value, there is um, um, an exception, bad optional access, and you can make it empty again with reset, so some interface is there. Here you can see what this means. If my function can return a string, but it might be that it does not return a string, we can have three cases. We can return an optional initialized by nothing. That means we return no string. We can return a string that is empty, which is a different um, case, a different state. And we can uh, have a, a string that's non-empty. And now if I use it, uh, then I check, as, as again, I check the S, and if uh, it yells true, there is a value, I can print it, but it might be empty, though it covers these two cases. And if I uh, have no value, I, I have nothing. Yeah, question there? Is there an equivalent to boost none? I think none is... I have something in mind that there is something, but good question. <laughs> boost none. I have to write it down. Maybe I learn more here than you. Value all? Yes, so, so I can say config dot config value all. Ah, uh, value all, yeah, value all, yeah. Value all, yeah, now I got it, yeah. Thank you. Good, variant. A variant is um, an object that can hold one of Several predefined alternatives. Um, it differs from variant in, in some things. For example, it does not allocate memory anymore, like boost does. Um, and it, the, the price is that it, under some strange conditions, it can become empty. Um, um, usually it's not empty. It, ha it is one of the specified values. So if I have a variant int string, I initialize it with 42, then it's clear because that's an int, this variant holds an int currently. And, un and, and unlike the variant, the union language feature, it's not that bits are interpreted in different ways, I know what it helps. It's, it's not a trick to have type conversions over bits. It, I can just hold one or the other. So I know that I held an int now, and um, if I assign a string, I know that I now hold a string, and I can ask for that. I can ask what is the index, and if the index is zero, it's this type. If it's one, it's this type. I can ask, please give me the string, and if it contains a string, it's fine. Otherwise, I get an exception. Or I can say, give me the first or second element. And uh, of course, there has to be one. Otherwise, this is um, an error. Um, the, if you don't initialize the object, the default constructor of the first type is used to initialize it. So, um, And if you don't have a type there, uh, you can use yourself a first alternative called monostate. And monostate is just a trick to be able to declare these objects and that they hold a state outside every other alternative. So that's the way it is used here. That... Um, here's some error handling. Well, first of all, I should say it can have multiple instances of the same type. So a variant can, ha can hold one int or another int or string. So you can have different semantics for the first and the second int. And then, of course, it's, it's a problem if you ask, give me the int. That's, of course, not possible. But you can still say, give me the first or the second element in, of this variant. And if you assign a string, then it's clear that it is this one. Uh, so that's possible. So if I try to get a double, that's a compile time error because we have no double. If I get the fourth 
alternative, that's an error. If I get int, that's an error because I have two ints. Uh, but this is OK um, and might throw in runtime exception if currently the variant contains something different. Yeah. And you have visitors as in boost. You can say, I want to I wanna deal with all the different alternatives I have. So whatever my, my um, object has, uh, I have a visitor that I can call visit with and say, for this object, please, depending on what the type is, use this or this or this um, function to deal with it. The third one is std any. std any is um, again uh, maybe maybe I have enough time to show you one thing because um, no that's not the thing for variant one thing I want to show you um, uh, the case when uh, when a variant can become empty it's usually not possible unless you you have an exception which you don't handle properly. And because that's possible, a variant can become empty. And here you see what, how you can do that. You say, um, for example, I have a variant of float int initialized by a float. Then I call here, um, here a, a function that initializes it with an int, but it throws an exception doing that. So while assigning a new value, I get an exception. And the question is, what is then the case? And that's the case where we say, oh, we don't have a value. Because while it, assigning a new value, an exception was thrown. And then this, this reads, leads to, to semantically an empty state, but we don't call it empty. We call it valueless by exception. So you can check for that. And um, yeah, so, so, so we have that. It's, yeah, it, it's something you have to keep in mind, but as I said, it's not the outcome of typical code, but it can happen. Any. Any is um, like boost any, um, an object that is possible to hold any type, unless the other two types, you have no clue what it holds, all information has to be checked at runtime. Uh, for the other types, you can find out at compile time whether this is a valid type or valid value or not, uh, to some extent, if the type system allows you. Here, we can have just any type. The trick is that internally, we store the type ID of what we stored, and we store the bytes. That's all. And so if I say I assign a string, or here this, then I have later to test, is there a value? So any can empty be empty again. And then if the type has this type ID, then I know that this is a type, and then I can cast it to this type, and then I have the value inside. And that's, that's the whole trick. It keeps the type ID plus the value. Has value is the question of whether it's equivalent to the type ID of void? Yeah. I don't know. I have on my list that uh, I have to double check what happens with void types for these types. I don't know. So I, th I think it has value itself returns a Boolean as far as yes, Ah, you mean that if I don't have a value, is that the same as type saying I have type ID void? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know, simply. Uh, you can have move semantics, but you can't use types that have no, own, that have no copy semantics. So copy semantics is required, but it's not mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have something like this. You can move something inside, and then you have to move it out this with this syntax out. But as I said, if you try to use this with move-only types, this will not compile. Okay. okay. 
some other libraries. Um, here we have um, double check the date. Yeah, here we have the pure new library. That's a real library. That's again from Boost coming Boost file system. If you are not familiar with Boost file system, it's a library that tries to um, yeah to standardize the way we deal with file systems, even having in account that there's open VMS and Unix and Windows with all the differences they have. And um, here you see some example what you can do. This is an example that uh, more or less you can exactly use uh, with Boost. So you only have to exchange the header file and you have to change the namespace. So here I use now SCD file system path instead of Boost file system path. And I can initialize a path coming from the command line if, the, if there is something, I can check, is it a regular file? I can ask for the file size. Is it the directory? If so, I can iterate over the directory. Now, of course, with the new modern C++ things like auto-reference, that's a directory entry, iterating over all the elements. The trick is that the directory iterator itself provides begin and end, and then we can use the path again to print or to, to do further things. And um, maybe one interesting thing also is if I print P, a path, it's usually quoted, so it, it is at the beginning and the end with, with double quotes. But as I said, that's nothing that changed from Boost. It's just standardized here. You can modify things. You can say here, I can, I can declare a path, by the way, with the operator um, divide by. <laughs> that's a path operator. That works. Um, and it's not backslash in Windows, by the way. It's still this syntax in the source code. Um, I create a directory. I create a symbolic link. I have the, um, yeah, extend the path operator. I can convert it to string. And if I want to convert it to string, that's what I need when I, for example, open this as an open OF stream. We have not ex no, no real integration now for F streams with path elements. I think that's still an issue. But uh, as usual, we, we come up to standardize the different libraries and putting things together, it's some, sometimes we learn. Sometimes we think about it, sometimes not. Yeah, some, some, some things to tell you about that. So um, we, we have to take in mind that different file systems have different definitions of what is a path and what is a file. So we, we, we have a root name in Windows, this might be C colon in many or all systems that are Unix or POSIX-like or standardized um, universal, I don't know the name, universal path syntax is double uh, slash host. Then the root directory, then a directory separator, which might be slash or backslash or dot sometimes. And then we have file name consisting of a so-called stem and an extension. And you have to deal with that. And what this means is, for example, that if you use this program, I have foo, then bar behind. I print this out under Unix, that's foo bar. Under Windows, it's foo backslash bar. And if I take this path, I print it, I would print this path. But when I make it make preferred, I use the preferred syntax of the current file system. So that would mean here, under Unix, I have this, under Windows, this. And I should write here open VMS that would say in um, square brackets foo dot bar and then afterwards data dot txt for example to give you something totally different and then we have root name root directory with a different syntax and maybe one interesting thing is is this an absolute path under unix the answer will be yes under windows the answer will be no because an absolute path requires that you can start from some root and we have c colon this path and we have D call on this path. So this is not an absolute path under Windows. And we don't hide that in the library because we can't. It's, it's not an absolute path under Windows. So that's something we keep in mind and sometimes leads to surprising behavior. Yeah, the UNC path is supported. That's, as I said, that's, that's, um, that's more or less the syntax. Yeah, that can be used, yeah. So in, in Windows, there is an absolute path if you start with a UNC path. Yeah. Then, then you can have something absolute, yeah. 
Um, we have made some changes when we adopted the file system library. Um, let me go here to show you the examples, and that's better to explain it. So there might be, we might break some compatibility if you just switch from Boost uh, to C++17. For example, we no longer say that .git is an extension. In the old existing libraries, this was a, a, considered to be an extension and not a file name. So if you ask for stem, remember, a file name is stem plus extension. Stem was empty, and this will not, no longer be the case. And now um, here we say this is now the file name is git, stem is git, the extension is empty, and this was different before. Another interesting thing is here. We have in the existing library, we, we, we say foo bar dot is the same as foo bar. Um, and sometimes the dot gets automatically appended. And if you ask what is the file name of this, you got dot. We thought this is very confusing. And this was a source of confusion when you used boost. And we said this is the last moment we can clean it up. And we said, no, this is, the file name is empty here. Here's the file name dot, here's the file name empty. And uh, this has a couple of consequences when you deal with it. For example, has file name will now yield false here. Previously, it, it did yield uh, true. So there are some changes. And, uh, but we, we now consider in, in a sub-working group of the library working group that this is more consistent. It's still not adopted. It will be adopted in the next meeting, uh, all these changes that make this consistent as it is. I hopefully it, I hope it will. And then we cared about one thing, that everybody who uses file systems has a problem. Everybody has relative paths. Pro compute the path between two absolute paths. Almost everybody has a helper function implemented, and they all have their flaws. It's really complicated because you say, if I have a path A, B, C, and another path A, B, so what's the way to go from um, A, B to C? And the answer, you would say, is C. So what is the problem to have a function to compute a relative path between two absolute paths? Well, there are a lot of problems. One thing is, should we normalize this? So if I say sub dot dot sub dot, should this yield sub or this? How to deal with symbolic links? This becomes very interesting if sub dot dot sub is not the same as sub because here's a symbolic link involved and suddenly you switch to another place in your file system. And um, what does it mean to deal with dot and dot dot? What if the path exists or is it important that the path exists or not? And uh, what if there is no common root? If, for example, you, you want to have the path between two things, these two things, what is the relative path between these? Should we give you an error or should we just give you instead the absolute path? So a lot of questions. This took, took us a lot of time. I know it because I was partially involved into writing that. And just to tell you at least one thing, sometimes things are surprising if you have this A, C, D is a symbolic link to this A, B. And you go into a Unix shell and say C, D, A, D, E. You are here, but if you ask your shell, the shell will say you are an A, D, E. It will tell you that. And you can say something like ls dot dot E because you are, you are you are going here and then back here, but you are, you are here, and dot dot and then e would, should not work. It's a courtesy of your shell that this works, but it's a lie. And if we have a file system library, we have, of course have to think how to deal with that. You, by the way, you can do this by use pvd minus, minus big capital P or cd minus p, and you will see the real path you are in, or that you can. You can you can, after a CD command, see the real path you are in. I didn't know that before I started to standardize this little function. I was very surprised. Maybe you are also. 
So depending on that, we decided that we say, well, if we move around here, if we want to go from here, x, y, z, to here, a, b, c, test file, well, without knowing anything about um, symbolic links, we should go um, up, no, with symbolic links, without knowing anything about symbolic links, we have to go up, 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 A, B, C, test file. But because this is the same as this, we only have to go up and then B, C, test file. And the consequence is we have a couple of functions to deal with relative paths. Some are lexically, they don't, don't take the existing symbolic links into account. Some are, you, uh, take the existing file system into account. So it, became an interesting issue. Yeah, I think that's it. So that's the most important things that change about file system library. Another thing, parallel execution of STL algorithms. While we have support in, in modern C++ for concurrency, we don't have algorithm support in a way that we can say, if I call an algorithm like for each or sort, even better sort, that are, and I have either multiple cores or, or uh, multiple CPUs or whatsoever, that I can benefit from the fact that I can sort in parallel different areas of my containers or of my ranges. And this is done in, in, in a so-called parallel STL, and this was part of the so-called parallel TS, and it now became uh, part of C++ 17. And I'm a stupid application programmer, so I started to find out what is the difference, because we have now three different strategies and guarantees we can give, and this is what I came about, and uh, unless somebody proves me wrong, this is a poor man's way to explain the different policies. The first policy we have now is when we want to compute a deal with all elements and with each element we have to call A, B, and C. That we first call for the first element A, B, and C, then for the second A, B, and C, and then for the third A, B, and C in our container. So that's sequential. That's what we have already for all the algorithms. But now we have two other ways. The one, one thing is parallel is sequenced and the other is unsequence execution. And sequence execution made, I can in parallel start to process A, B, and C for different elements, but it's guaranteed that inside my thread, I have after A for the first element, I call B for the first element, and then C for the first element. While here, even that is not guaranteed. I can say I can start in my thread with the A for the first element, then A for the second element, is, is, is on then here again, so, so I have different paths here to go through my processings. And of course, different guarantees are given. This, this, if you have this guarantee, then you can use a parallel or vectorized execution. But if you have a lock here, a, a lock, a, a global lock, which is unlocked here, this will block, of course, and cause a big trouble. So you have to know, so we have to give some guarantees so that the uh, execution of the parallel algorithm know what they can do, whether they can use this or this policy to deal with them. And anything else is implementation defined, quality of implementation. Yeah, yes, you, you simply have a new argument at the beginning saying par unsequenced, Parallel or sequence. Sequence is like not having the argument. Parallel is, um, yeah, if you have a lock or something like that, you should choose that one. And here's, if you really have nothing, if, if, if the, the computation here can be done for one element and then for the other element before you go to the second statement. So that's, that's okay. Splicing sets and maps. We have some new support to deal with the fact that I want to move elements from one set or one map to another. Here you can see how it happens. I have a map initialized with uh, these three elements. Here I have another map with this element. What I can do now, I can extract this element or I can use an iterator or find the element by value, by key. 
And then I can insert it in the other map. The point here is that we keep the memory. So usually when I take an element out of a set of map and insert it somewhere else, the new element gets new memory. But here we, we get it with extract, we get a handle including the memory for this element so that inserting it somewhere else becomes a cheap operation. That's, that's more or less all. With some uh, error handling issues, for example, if I extract 3.3 .3 here and I insert it here, this is a map, not a multi-map. So this is an error. Then you have a special state which uh, you can use here. You can, you can get the information which key and map is here and, and whether this was succeeded. So insert it as false here and you can deal with that. So let's take this example. Like here, one thing I want to show you is one interesting side effect here is that you can now cheaply change the key of map elements. You can say, here I have a map, one, two, three different fruits. I extract the element with two. This is a handle. The type is auto. Um, and then I can set the key to four, and then I move it back into this map and then I have the new map. And the interesting thing again is I have no memory allocation here involved at all. It's just changing the key and then inserting it again somewhere else. So a cheap way to change the key of maps. And by the way, it can be used in sets and maps. It can be used to move elements between a multi-set and a set. And uh, also it applies to unordered elements. Elementary string conversions. For those who, who write low level, who implement low, library, low level libraries, yet another way to convert integers and uh, um, floating point numbers to strings and back and forth so that we don't have to use printf or something like that because streams are far too expensive. No allocators involved, so it's not like, like the two string uh, API we, we already have there. This is a low-level interface, uh, so we can say, I have a range of characters here, so begin and end, and I want to convert this decimal into a sequence of characters containing four and four. I do that. And one interesting thing is we guarantee round-trip ability. So if we say convert this floating point number to a character sequence, it's guaranteed if I read it back with the corresponding from chars uh, function, it will have the same value on the same platform. It's not guaranteed everywhere because it depends how many digits have to be written to be guaranteed that the exact the same value comes back. That's platform dependent and um, it might be, might be a pretty long uh, list of numbers though, depending on your platform, by the way. We have new shared locks. In <laughs> when we standardized in modern C++, mutex and locks, we had a great example written by Howard Hinnant. And now we adopted a little bit, or 50% in C++11, then 20 more percent in C++14, and then now maybe 10% more in C++17. We still not adopted all. Let's see what happens in the next standard. We should have adopted everything from the beginning because it was a cool design. So what we have now is we have read-write locks, which we was introduced in C++14, but only as with timed mutexes. Now we have shared mutexes that, that can't be timed, and we have support for them. Atomic for atomic, we have the C interface. We hate C interfaces, uh, so we have something new. And we now have a cons x bool atomic is always log free. Uh, we decided that this is good enough. It's usually not that interesting whether we know it's sometimes or is, um, is always log free. So it's never log free. So in here, these constants might have one of three values. This is good enough, and this will, be, will have C++ uh, support, so C++ syntax for uh, this question. And then we have 
uh, new type traits. Now, we have a lot of new type traits, but, but we also have a general way to use the type traits if they return a value. You might know already that if I have something like that yeah, it's a type, for example, um, the corresponding constant type of, of something, that I can, instead of writing uh, make const or remove const, I hope this is exactly the name, I'm not, not sure, um, that instead of writing dot colon colon type at the end, I can now write uh, make const underscore t. And now we have the same thing for the um, value type traits. So instead of writing is const t colon colon value, I can now write is const value of t, which makes something like this a little bit shorter or more convenient. It's, by the way, an application of so-called variable templates, which were introduced in C++14, uh, where we can say this is, this is a shortcut of a variable for this member of a structure. So that's a typical application of variable templates. We have new numeric library functions. I'm not really an expert here, so if somebody tells me now we have Bessel functions or elliptic or polynomial functions, I have no clue what this means in detail, but if you care, you probably know. And uh, we have um, uh, uh, the greatest common divider and the least common, what, was it, what is M? Hmm? Multiply. Um, uh, yeah, so a, a little bit more new um, numerics library features now. And then we have a couple of other things. Let me see how much slides I have left. Yeah? Is that a template? Actually, I don't know. Um, we can look. Yeah, I, I don't know whether it's generalized as a template. I would consider, yes, but... I have to double check. And then we have a couple of other minor fixes. We have, um, so string has now a non-const data member, which was missing. We have new search algorithms like Boyer Moore and Boyer Moore Horspool for those who know what that means. So that's better algorithms to search something. We have move support. Uh, for memory source management, so special classes where you can say I have I want to I want to have my memory management and want to deal with it in with uh, with um, with helper functions. I I don't know the details here. Um, for yeah, explicit alignment I showed you in the talk before. So we have new. Uh, new new uh, functions so that we can align now data that we allocate on the heap. Um, and we have a couple of new type traits. One thing is is callable. That's maybe on interest. And one thing that is has unique object representations. What does that mean? That means that I say for any value of my object, it has always has the same bits to represent to the value. It's, it's only a unique representation of bits to have that value. That means you can hash over the bits instead of the, to, to hash over the object and get a unique hash number. So this is useful when you do hashing. Um, it, it doesn't work for, for values where you can say, I have different bit representation for the same value. For example, like in like in float or in uh, strings or so, then, then it's a problem. But for anything else, I can do that to hash over the bits of an object and get a unique hash value, yeah. Question on that. If you have a struct that has padding in it, have a struct that says char and then int, what will that say about has unique object representation? It, it, if, it has, if it is a struct that has char and int inside, as far as I know, it, it has on the platform a unique representation. It's always the same value, has the same format of bits. So it would answer yes so here. If you've got, well, if you have padding, you don't know what those bits are. Oh, so if I have padding. Then you can't do the mem copy trick. 
yeah, so I would assume that it returns false. <laughs> That's the whole idea here. Um, but uh, I have to double check. Or maybe you do and send me an email. Oh, well, <laughs> Good. Okay, for the cash, for the cash alignment. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you say the support for the explicit alignment for heap allocation is also for cash alignment. You say. Okay. Thank you very much. You find out exactly where I have no clue about some things of the library. <laughs> Yeah. How much can I pack into one cache line? How much can I pack in one cache line? Is it? Yeah. Is it okay? So how? And is that going to be? Is that yeah. going to be one hit or more? The yeah. destructive one is what do I have to do to make sure that they're not on the same cache line to stop sharing? Okay. So how much have I? So what do I have to do and, and uh, to make sure that they are not on the same cache line? Yeah. To avoid false sharing or to avoid false. Yeah. Principle. I have to repeat because. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. I'm happy to explain it better in future once I understood it in detail. Thank you. You would. Um, Chat Pointer now has support for, um, for arrays so that you have um, uh, that automatically the destructor calls delete. Um, um, square brackets instead of delete without square brackets. We had that already in Unix pointer and everybody was uh, wondering why we don't have support here for shared pointer for the same thing. Yeah, we have some, some bug fixes or fixes in general. Uh, some things, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just can ex I tell you. So one thing is for, for memory, me memory um, for, for the memory models, we have some policies to place memory barriers. And it turned out that nobody did implement memory order consume uh, special. So the, as a consequence, uh, it's currently discouraged until we find out what we really mean and then bring it back to, uh, to the compilers. So that's... It's, 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 it's exactly like that. So temporarily discouraged is this value for memory order management. Yeah, and then, yeah, sometimes some, some functions return a reference to what they inserted because we, we, we were not consistent there, for example, uh, because for insert functions we have that. Um, we have uh, in SCD function no longer supports allocators. In shared from this, we fixed some things because it was not guaranteed what happened if shared from this is used without an, for an object that never was uh, held by a shared pointer. Uh, the old standard was simply not clear about that, and now we know that this throws a bad weak pointer. So that is, this is a weak pointer, and we throw the corresponding exception if we if we use a weak pointer that refers to nothing. Um, adding const expression in a huge number of places, really a huge number. I, I think every meeting come, I don't know, 10 papers about we should add const expo here and here and here and here. Um, shared pointers now provide a weak type. Uh, maybe one thing is undefined behavior for type traits now if there is no behavior. And um, that was interesting. If you had a reference or pointer, and you said make unsigned. The, the behavior was undefined. So because the specification was, it's required that this is an integer. And if it was not, and a reference is not an integer, it only refers to an integer, make unsigned has undefined behavior. Uh, so if you use that, you could have on one platform one thing and the other platform and another thing. And here, thanks to some guys, I think from Russia, um, we now have the guarantee that instead of having undefined behavior, we say this is simply an error to use it because this is not 
portable code and we, we don't lose anything here if we say this is an error. Sometimes in the standardization we have the tendency to give freedom of implementation to the platform providers, but we should not give this freedom in cases that they're obviously wrong in, on all platforms. So this is a good example where we fix that. Yeah, that's it. Probably I missed two or three things. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, but that's, that's what I learned so far from the standard. I think a lot of interesting things are coming. And as usual, I showed you some of the combinations of these features. We will, we will find out in the next three years what we missed with all these libraries and the language features. I didn't talk about some things like Londa or other things you might have heard there. There are still some strange things really happening in the standard and in the communication between core guys and library guys uh, where I, yeah, usually I'm sitting down and, and just wondering about what people are talking about. That's my problem as an application programmer. Anyway, do we have any questions? I am hopefully can answer. So if not, that's it. Thank you very much again. And uh, good evening. Have a good party, I would say. Thank you.